So hello, welcome everyone to the fourth Civil War History UK group and a warm welcome to Chris Mikowski. All the way, ladies and gentlemen, from Stevenson's Ridge, which backs on to Spotsy's Battlefield, which is Spotsylvania, sorry. So what's it like living and breathing the Civil War? It's fantastic. Um, I live in the Fredericksburg area in Virginia, and you can't turn around without tripping over history here. Um, and it's actually cool because we have colonial area history, colonial era history. Uh, George Washington was raised around here. Uh, I don't know if that name still uh, strikes fear in the heart of the British or not. Well, you know, but, uh, uh, we like to blame the French. You know. Okay. See, uh, yeah, that's a that's a pretty good compromise. Uh, so well, we've got that, and then we've got Civil War history, and. Uh, one of the things that I particularly like about this area's Civil War history is the war really comes here in the spring of 1862 and it's here through the summer of 64 uh, and beyond. And so you have this huge span of the war that's here and you see the characters change, the cast change, the tactics change, the technology change. Um, so it's a fascinating area to dig in. That is amazing. Okay, so I'm going to, because uh, also you've got how many battlefields in that area? Because obviously the war came to and through, uh, came through that area quite a bit, didn't it? So there's a lot around there. So there are four that are preserved by the National Park Service here. Uh, Fredericksburg, which is December of 1862. Chancellorsville, which is the following May of 63. Then the armies leave the area. They go to a little place called Gettysburg. Maybe you've heard oh, of it. Oh, where's that? Come, I've never heard of yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, I know, I know. Uh, they come back here in the fall, and there's actually a campaign uh, that starts at Thanksgiving in, in late November of 63 called the Mine Run Campaign. That's a completely unpreserved battlefield, except for a small portion that the uh, American Battlefield Trust has preserved. Um, so really that's that's three and then in the uh, the spring of 64 they march into the area again and come to the wilderness and then Spotsylvania so really there are five major battlefields in this area yeah. four of which are preserved by the park service and and the thing that strikes me about the wilderness is when they uh, come across their comrades the following year after you know after the first campaign you know um, they come over there that was their bones and stuff coming up from the shallow graves that must have been horrendous yeah, there, there are members of Winfield Scott and Hancock's Second Corps who camp on the Chancellorsville battlefield, some of them in the very places they themselves had fought, and they find the bones of members of their own regiment. Yeah, so they might they might even have been friends or, or you know, yeah. yeah, brothers or whatever. Yeah, that's horrible. Um, can I just ask about the civilians of Fredericksburg, you know, because that really interests me because people overlook the, the civilians, don't they? You know, I mean, they're stuck in the middle of this, you know, so... You know, the day the Union Army turns up, um, you know, it's mid-November. So did the, did the um, civilians of Fredericksburg have a warning before, you know, uh, they, they turned up? They did um, and they didn't. I mean, the, the Union Army actually occupies this area starting in March of 62. There's an occupying force that's here all spring and into the summer. They leave. Um, so the, the residents were, were pretty used to having Union soldiers around. Um, okay. One of the guys who was in charge of that occupying force for a while was John Reynolds, folks from Gettysburg. Uh, Gettysburg yeah. fans will know John's name. Um, he got along with the civilians so well that uh, during the, the Peninsula campaign, Reynolds gets captured. And the residents of Fredericksburg actually petitioned to have Reynolds released from jail because he oh, was... Wow. Uh, was so good to him. So yeah. um, that all changes when the army comes back in November yeah. Yeah. and uh, Provost Marshal Marcina Patrick threatens to bombard the city if people don't straighten up. There are huge refugee streams that leave the town and um, it's really tumultuous. Um, so when they're turning up in mid-November, it's quite deserted then, I would imagine, by that yeah. stage, is it? They, well, it's not until the army shows up and it looks like there's going to be a big fight and then people leave and then there's no big fight, and so people start to come back, and then the fight okay. actually does Oh, happen that's, that, that's a bummer, yeah, because I'm wondering whether someone opens the curtains one day and they go, oh, my God, it's the Union Army sitting there, you know. I mean, that must have been pretty scary. Yeah. But there you yeah. go. But um, So, yeah. Um, can I also ask about, you know, so when they started evacuating, would they, would they have taken their, their slaves with them as well? You know, um, some people would have uh, Fredericksburg 
um, had a, um, about 5,000 people or so at the time of the war, um, about half of whom are enslaved. Um, once the Union Army shows up in the spring, uh, there's going to be a lot of self-emancipation that happens. I mean, that brings the front line of yep. emancipation right to the Rappahannock. And so you'll find a lot of people, um, a lot of enslaved people from Spotsylvania particularly will just slip away and, and find freedom for themselves. Okay. And is is that after the, um, oh, I can't remember what they call it now. So uh, they, uh, the Contraband of War Act comes in. Is that after that? Because I can't remember when that happens. Um, well, there are a number of contraband acts that... that uh, different commanders try to in, in, uh, enact and, mm -hmm. and Lincoln's retracting them here and there. Um, finally, when he issues the preliminary emancipation proclamation in September, yeah. um, that really kind of jacks up the energy level and, uh, and uh, you know, enslaved people really understand that the federal government's gonna do something about this now. And so you do see an increase in uh, emancipation after that, self-emancipation. Okay. And, uh... This is a really uh, interesting question. I like this one. Um, so I watched a, a, an interesting documentary and I won't mention which one it was, but there was a particular um, civil war expert on there, yourself, and it was about Fredericksburg. And it was mentioned about the, um, the trading between the troops uh, mm -hmm. to the lead up to the battle, which I find really fascinating. And I'm not talking about just uh, goods either. They were trading, uh, I would imagine, insults as well. And, uh, you know, so that I find that quite really, you know, quite funny and interesting in a way that the fact that they're doing that, you know. And the armies are actually in this area all through the winter and into the spring. And so uh, a lot of the, the folks who are on picket duty establish long term relationships with the guys on the other side. And so there's a lot of uh, good natured ribbing. And, uh, you know, there are instances where, you know, you, you read about this elsewhere in the war where um, they become friendly enough that when an attack's about to come, they'll give each other a heads up because they've come to become, I wouldn't say friends, but friendly with the guys on the other side. Yeah, and, like, oh, and that, that's up, a right? sad, sorry, that's a sad fact that they're countrymen as well, isn't it? You know, and they're fighting each other at the end of the day. That's the sad thing about it, you know, at the end of the day. But yeah, yeah. that's really cool. So um, what sort of insults were they uh, shouting at each other without swearing, obviously? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, just a lot of good natured, uh, you know, ribbing each other and, um, you know, really calling each other um, to account for their bravery or their cowardice or uh, mostly like, hey, your, your generals must not know what they're doing. Um, when Ambrose Burnside tries his mud march in January and the Union Army gets bogged down, Confederates can see it all happening. They're holding up signs that say Burnside stuck in the mud, you know. <laughs> Um, so, you know, any chance they can to, to trade some barbs back and forth. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, Union camp. Where was that? Was that was that just behind uh, the Heights? Was it Stafford Heights? Is it is that where they were positioned? So uh, because the Union Army is so big, um, you know, they've got over 120,000 soldiers here. Um, they really spread over, over, you know, dozens and dozens of square miles. Uh, so each corps will position itself anywhere from Falmouth down to Stafford. Um, so we've got kind of like an arc along the river that might run about 10 miles. And then kind of behind the lines, um, you know, 10 or 12 miles up as far as uh, Acquire Creek, where a lot of the supplies are coming through. So um, they spread out across the landscape and it's like a plague of locusts. Um, and on the Confederate side, they're also spread out like a plague of locusts. So um, both armies are really hard on the civilian populations during that winter because the armies are really trying to uh, support yeah. themselves. Why, why do you think um, Burnside was reluctant to go across, you know, without the pontoons? I mean, I, was the river too high? Was it, was there somewhere they could have crossed maybe? There was no real good place to cross. Um, there were a few river crossings up river from Fredericksburg, but the Confederate cavalry um, could have given plenty of advance notice to Lee's army. Um, those would have been difficult to, uh, crossings to get across the, the confederates could have easily contested them and then um the the other thing that a lot of people forget about is that it's not just a matter of getting your infantry across but you've got to get your artillery across you've got to get your supply wagons across and you've got to get your horses across and so you've got to have a river bottom that allows for all that kind of transport so burnside's real concern was that he would get troops across the river um, but not be able to get 
logistical supply, not be able to get artillery. And then if it rained upstream and the river rose suddenly, you know, and they don't have radar, they can't tell what the weather's right. doing upstream. So um, if the river raises, then those those soldiers are cut off. And so they become vulnerable. So Burnside really yeah. wanted to make sure that he had good, secure avenues of transportation back and forth. And that, that gives it a lot better, you know, a bit more perspective, doesn't it, of uh, the way he was thinking, because he gets a lot of criticism for that, don't he? You know. and, if you, and if you were to go downriver from Fredericksburg, the Rappahannock gets wider, it gets deeper, mm -hmm. uh, it's a tidal river, so it's affected, you know, by the tides. Um, so you can't really cross down there without bridging at all. Um, and no, so, and then, you know, really so good. if they wanted to go round, they would have had to go miles just to, to get round. And yep. then they would have probably bumped into Lee somewhere else, I suppose. Um, so anyway, can I just quickly ask about Sykes's regular divisions, uh, when, uh, where they were in, in, you know, where they were on the battlefield? Sure. So um, on the 13th of December, Burnside's going to have two major attacks, one at the south end of the field against Prospect Hill, uh, and then a series of attacks in the north end of the field against the Sunken Road in Stonewall and Marie's Heights. And that's kind of the action that, that people are most familiar with. He's going to have a total of seven waves go against the sunken road. Uh, Sykes is going to be in that last wave. Most of the focus there is actually um, uh, toward the end of the sunken road where there's an abandoned um, railroad line. And George Getty's division is going to sneak up through there and try to charge out of there and mount a bayonet attack. And uh, Sykes is attacking at the other end of the stone wall in support of Getty's bayonet attack. So Sykes is going to come up. Uh, it's very late in the day. Uh, it's starting to, to, to um, you know, nightfall is, is, is starting to fall. Um, dusk, they're going to come up out of the city along Hanover Street, right along the fairgrounds to their left. They'll get as far about as the Stratton House, where there are already considerable number of Federals that are pinned down. And um, that's about as far as they're going to make it. Um, attention, um, really, as, as Getty's guys make their charge with their bayonets and they yell, huzzah, and come running, um, they really break the element of surprise. And that allows the Confederates through the gloaming to open fire and uh, really you know, beat back both of those attacks. So do they get stuck out there on that? You know, they get stuck out for a night, don't they? Some of them. Pretty much. Um, so, you know, they're there with the, the six waves before them pinned to the ground, taking cover behind the Stratton house, a few other buildings that are scattered across the plains, um, not really able to push forward, not really able to get back safely. Um, and it's a cold, miserable night that December 13th. Uh, guys freeze to death who were wounded out in that battle. Yeah. Um, I've got to ask just quickly about the left grand division, which assaults, because uh, I think that's like the forgotten part of Fredericksburg, because when I came to Fredericksburg, there was only the Stonewall and there was only Mary's Heights, you know, and obviously the film Gods and Generals, you know, it's that is what and, and you know, I believe that was it. You know, I didn't know anything about the rest of it until I started looking into it, you know, and of course, you know, Meade, how how close was Meade to breaking the Confederate line? He was very close. I mean, he did break through. It's just that he didn't have support. And uh, his Grand Division Commander, William Franklin, is, is not prepared to exploit Meade's breakthrough. Franklin is very tepid. Um, a more aggressive commander at the end of the field there um, certainly could have done something to, uh, to take advantage of that situation. Yeah. But uh, Franklin holds back an entire corps, doesn't get involved at all. He sends off Double Day's, uh, Double Day's division to the south and basically lets them be tied up. So that's part of Meade's support. Um, so Franklin um, really drops the ball. Um, and, and ironically, Burns side really put Franklin down there because Franklin had a long established career. He had a good reputation. He was dependable. He was experienced. Burnside thought the south end of the field would be in good hands under Franklin and Franklin really uh, botches it. And and the guy that let uh, me down, I can't remember his name now. What's the guy's name? Sorry, I've forgotten. Um, he, uh, he sends three messages to, well, no, it's two messages. And then in the end, he has to go and 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 heard the saying that the rocks, uh, sorry, the stones crept or something. <laughs> he's an angry man, and he made. In, I'm sorry, I'm listening to um, um, what is it? Um, the full measure at the moment. I know it's fictionalish, but in that you just get the sense this guy's a moody guy, you know. 
Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, Mead is so temperamental as men call him the uh, goddamn goggle-eyed snapping turtle. Um, <laughs> and his chief of staff calls him old peppery, you know, so Mead's yeah. got a terrible, terrible temper. Um, I had to let you kind of tell the story a little bit more so I knew who you were talking about because when you said, yeah, yeah, sorry, let me down. It could have been his boss, John Reynolds. Could have oh, been sorry. Yeah. No, I friend. mean, the guy that was in reserve. So you're talking about him. David Bell Birney, who yeah, is... Yeah, I can't say... Of... That, the reason I asked is because I couldn't say his name. I can't say his second name. But, yeah. you know, so that's why. Anyway, I can't. I still can't say it now. But anyway, I'm not going to attempt it because I'm embarrassed. <laughs> B- so, yeah, Birney, yeah, come, I can't Birney's say it. supposed to come up in support, and, and he doesn't yeah. because he's waiting for orders through the chain of command. And that's when Meade loses his temper and his staff officer says you could hear the... St- you can see the stones creep at the swearing he does <laughs> oh, okay. and uh, he basically commandeers Barony's men to come up but by then it's too late yeah i mean you know i mean there's thirty five thousand up there weren't there well, on jackson's division mm-hmm. is that right yeah and- so yeah they're going to plug that quick aren't they um i just i just want to quickly ask you know just quickly ask because this is important as well it's about sergeant richard kirkland you know and his bravery and, uh, I, and I don't understand how, why he never got, you know, a Medal of Honor. You know, I find that sad, actually, regardless. Uh, well, the main reason is because he was a Confederate soldier and the Medal of Honor yeah. was uh, was awarded by the federal government. Um, yeah. So the Confederate government didn't, I mean, they did have a, like a, 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 an award of merit, um, but it wasn't the type of thing that they would have given out for helping out the Yankees. You know, no, so. of course. Yeah, I'll get you there. Yeah, sorry. But yeah, but I mean, no, but, but for, you know, nowadays, why couldn't he be given one? You know, I'm going to start a movement. Yeah. That's what I'm going to do. Uh, and and you would find a lot of opposition to that. Um, just yeah, because, of course. And again, because he's a Confederate. Yeah, because he's a Confederate. That's why your Confederates generally are not buried in national cemeteries because yeah. they were for federal soldiers. Um, I completely get that. Yeah. But also, again, you know, he helped the Federals out. So, you know, I mean, some of them could have died, couldn't they, if they had a drink of water? And this, it's, a, it's a wonderful story. He's, he's 19 years old. He's a sergeant from, from South Carolina, jumps the wall with a bunch of canteens and tries to minister to wounded soldiers who are uh, out there in the field. And at first, Federals don't know what they're up to, and they're taking pot shots at him. And then when they realize he's taking water to their wounded comrades, they let him go, and he's out there for two hours just trying oh to come. Oh, my God, them. that's a long time. What a man. What a guy. Anyway, I have to ask you, about Stonewall Jackson, because I hear a little birdie told me that you had a man crush on him. I totally. Have a man crush on him. <laughs> and uh, my man crush is more sort of Grant and Lincoln, but you know. So I've got uh, a, a Stonewall Jackson bust on my oh, desk. Oh, lovely. And you, I mean, you uh, you live quite close to his the house where he passed away, didn't don't you? Yeah, it's a, uh, from where I live, it's uh, about 25 minutes. Oh, that's um, good. Then. Spent a lot of time down at the uh, so you, you accident. Sorry, darling, we've got to drive past it again. <laughs> <laughs> on the way to the store, you're like, yeah, we're just. It's not on the way to time. anything, so it's it's really. Oh, out fair of, enough. Um, well, she knows, then she's like, I know you're you're <laughs> lying to me now. <laughs> so, anyway, the biggest question of all, and this is massive because this is for all the armchair uh, armchair generals, and everyone it talks about this online. You know, you go on any any of the sites on Facebook or Instagram, Instagram, sorry. Um, if Jackson was at Gettysburg, do you think Lee would have maybe changed his tactics and changed his mind? Uh, you and I should just do a session on that question. Um, I, okay. you know, I love it when people toss it to me. It's like an underhanded softball. Um, you can't Sorry. get Jackson to, to Gettysburg in the first place because of all the extenuating circumstances. Yeah. Um, but let's somehow put Jackson on the field. I mean, uh, if Jackson's still with the army, I don't think the army even makes it to Gettysburg. Uh, the no. routes of March North are different, but let's just somehow put him there. And he, he takes the Hill on the first day. The federals just fall back to the next defensible um, mountain range or Hill or something. And they have the battle further South or further outside of Gettysburg. I don't think um, taking cemetery Hill or Culp's Hill substantially changes what eventually becomes the outcome. Um, because the Union Army still has time to consolidate. Um, in fact, the Federals would probably fall back to where more of the Army is coming up. Um, and so Meade would take advantage of that Pipe Creek line that he was trying to lay out. Um, so, you know, Jackson maybe buys uh, Lee a, a couple days of victory, but I don't think it substantially changes yeah, the outcome yeah. of the campaign. 
and uh, yeah, that was it really. That's uh, but um, anyway, I really appreciate you coming on. Can you just quickly tell everyone about the emerging civil war? Because I have been, I have plugged you on the on the group. I sure, did put sure. you up, uh, your guys. I'm joined as a patron as well. Um, Listen to one of the podcasts the other day. I will get through to some of the others. And also, I've got all your books on my Spotify list. It's not oh. Spotify list, sorry, Audible list. Mm, so I will start listening. So yeah, Emerging Civil War, there are 30 of us. Uh, most of us are public historians, meaning that we work on battlefields and museums. And, and we're really trying to connect the public with the story of the American Civil War. Um, you know, as you know, if you don't stay connected with our history, you don't benefit from the, the lessons that it has to offer. Um, you're doomed to repeat its mistakes, as, as the old saying yep. goes. And so uh, we really think that the Civil War is America's defining event, the revolution kind of established. Yeah, um, hang on, I'll just yeah. leave the room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want to talk about that. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but, Esky know, French. It, yeah. it was unfinished. Yeah, the French. It was uh, unfinished business. And um, yeah. you know, the Civil War is really kind of what ends up defining us. And we're still having conversations today that are unresolved in the Civil War. So, it's, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Great stuff. And anyway, thank you for coming on, Chris. I really appreciate it for giving up your morning. Um, no, did you have your no. breakfast? Because if you, because you look hungry. <laughs> I'm only joking. <laughs> That's just the look of, of being starved. Oh, no, that, that is very aggressive look. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much, Chris.